Ms. Dwight Allman. Got it. Uh, a Baylor University, and, and we're very pleased to be hosting uh, this kickoff session uh, of the HPT uh, seminar for spring semester 2022. Um, apologies if uh, you got sidetracked or were or misled by a, a, a phony Zoom address. That was my fault, I think. Um, but um, I'm hoping at this point, everybody who uh, wants to attend has been able to receive uh, the right address and, and uh, log in. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and, and thank Jeff uh, Church um, for the outsized role that he has played in putting this together originally and in keeping it uh, going. Um, today's um, session hosted by uh, Baylor University um, features uh, Professor Lee Ward, uh, a professor of political science at, at Baylor. Um, his research interests uh, lie in the, like primarily in the area of modern political theory and American political thought. Uh, his most recent book is entitled Recovering Classical P Liberal Political Economy, Natural Rights and the Harmony of Interests, uh, which will appear next uh, month uh, under the uh, University of Edinburgh Press moniker. Uh, and I think he wanted me to include a, a, a mention of the fact that it is now available uh, for pre-order. Um, <laughs> His, his paper today, uh, John Stuart Mill on liberalism and the university uh, is part of a new project uh, in which he seeks to examine political theorist reflections on the idea of the university in Germany, Britain and America. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Lee. Thank you very much, Dwight. And uh, thank you all for uh, uh, zooming in today and uh, welcome from snowy Texas. We don't usually say that very often, so. Uh, this paper is part of a larger project in which I seek to examine a series of debates among political theorists as they reflect on the political significance of the modern university in Germany, Britain, and the United States. This specific paper derives from the 19th century British debate among Herbert Spencer, John Henry Newman, and John Stuart Mill. As a draft of a paper that I presented at the Southern last month, it reads more like a discrete treatment of Mill than it actually is. I certainly think Mill had important things to say about the university in liberal society, but I still conceive of the project as a conversation among, about the university among distinct voices, including the scientific, religious uh, uh, arguments for higher education, in addition to Mill's liberal argument. As such, I'm happy to speak more about Newman and uh, Spencer in uh, discussion period or question period after. I just want to add a few points about the context of the rector's address that weren't in the paper before turning to the text. One of the peculiar prerogatives of students in the ancient Scottish universities dating back to medieval times was the right to elect whomever they wish as their chancellor or the rector. Over the centuries, prime ministers, laureates, cele celebrities of all stripes have been elected to these posts. In 1865, the students at St. Andrews in Fife elected Mill, who was a sitting MP, as well as arguably the most famous intellectual in Britain at the time. Mill rebuffed the honor at first, only grudgingly accepted, and then put off delivering his address for two years, until the very end. On February 1st, 1867, Mill gave his address. Witnesses say he spoke for nearly four hours in a rapid staccato manner. It must have been torture, but I promise you I'll be much briefer today. The rector's address stands out. Famously, Mill never attended university and is generally thought to have had little good to say about them. This is largely true. But by the late 1860s, the universities had become an intense political issue in Britain that caused Mill to reevaluate their significance. The rector's address has been characterized by commenters in various ways as a rather disappointing and pedestrian argument for general generic freedom, as a bold appeal for incorporating the Socratic method into higher education, as a stirring defense of classical education, as a formula to replicate Mill's own idiosyncratic education, as a critique of utilitarian ideas in education, or as a proposal in support of utilitarian ideas, or simply as a wildly unrealistic proposal for any actual university. I propose that Mill's intention in the rector's address was much more political than is typically supposed. In 1854, the parliament set on the process of modernizing the curriculum at Oxford and Cambridge, as England's rulers began to feel they were becoming intellectual backwaters compared to the great German and Scottish universities. There was also the heated political controversies 
inspired by the struggle to establish a Catholic university in Ireland, as well as the visceral opposition to Darwinism in certain circles in England. So it may sound strange to our ears to hear about a national parliament making laws about university curriculums or that establishing a Roman Catholic university could bring down a government, but that was the world in which Mill was speaking in 1867. So much for the context. When we turn to the address itself, it presents something of a challenge. One of the enduring questions among scholars is whether Mill's political theory was animated primarily by his concern about the homogenizing effects of public opinion per se, or rather was Mill focused on mobilizing public opinion in support of liberal causes. In this paper, I argue that Mill employed his most thorough treatment of higher education as a blueprint for his vision of the university as one of the central institutions responsible for the formation of public opinion in liberal society through elites capable of molding the public opinion among newly enfranchised classes in Britain in support of liberal politics. Perhaps the most challenging task of this paper is to reconcile the mill perhaps most familiar to many of us with the mill of the rector's address. The mill of the rector's address is like the mill of the principles of political economy or the considerations on government and seems rather different from the mill of on liberty. But Mill's concept of individuality cohabitates, perhaps in considerable tension, the political and moral reform impulses, some even say paternalism, that, are, that is unmistakable throughout Mill's corpus. Mill's presentation in the rector's address of the modern university as an instrument of liberal statecraft set him at odds with two important views of higher education at the time. In the opening section of the paper, I try to situate the rector's address in terms of the debate dominated by Spencer and Newman. Herbert Spencer was the great popularizer of Darwinism, who maintained that natural science provides the methodological foundation for all branches of higher education. John Henry Newman's lectures in his 1853 book, The Idea of the University, set out the position whereas the renowned Catholic prelate and former leader of the Oxford movement argued that the teaching of theology lies at the core of the academic mission of the university or of the Catholic university. Reflecting on the, upon the prospects for the future of the university, Mill sought to navigate a course from what he saw avoiding the Scylla and Charybdis of sectarian education on one hand and scientific determinism on the other. In response to Spencer, Mill launched an impassioned defense of the study of classical languages and ancient literature. Universities are about transmitting accumulated cultural knowledge, not professional training. In particular, Mill insisted on the continuing importance of Aristotelian logic and especially Platonic or Socratic dialectic. Mill saw dialectic as a method of inquiry, not of course, as a substantive teaching carrying metaphysical or moral commitments. That is Mill did not believe you need to buy the story of the Demiurge and the Timaeus or the symposium's ladder of love to get the significance of the platonic dialogues. In response to Newman's religious-based idea of the university, Mill starkly rejected the very idea of religious higher education. Religious and moral education are for the churches and for families, not for universities. It's not the university's job, says Mill, to make you a good Catholic, or for that matter, to make you a good person. In part, this is due to the nature of the subject, which he says does not admit of the kind of training universities do or that professors are qualified to teach. But Mill also believed the sectarian nature of religious education undermines the principle of academic freedom. As Mill queried, how can one take seriously a position that someone must hold as a term of their employment? Newman did not believe universities should encourage research. As he says, why would you need any students if the purpose is to do research? Institutes and academies can do that perfectly well. For his part, Mill supported university research in new subject areas, such as psychology and political economy, in addition to the task of transmitting the accumulated treasures of Western civilization. The term Mill used to identify the pedagogical methodology of the ideal university professor is what he called the model of the ethical teacher. By this, I take him to mean that the normative content of a university education derives from the general spirit of moral seriousness that at least should pervade the academy. Mill proposes that the aesthetic ideal can be a source of spiritual inspiration primarily directed to counter the effects of rampant materialism. I haven't heard anything. Sorry. Hi, Rob. 
Uh, presumably, this refined aesthetic sensibility among advanced modern peoples would provide the basis for what Mill calls the religion of humanity, with uh, great heroes like uh, Thomas Jefferson, or, uh, great heroes like George Washington and uh, Socrates. Mill began to flesh out near the end of his career. In order to understand Mill's efforts to align the academic mission of the university with the moral and social priorities of a liberal polity, we have to recognize the pivotal distinction he drew between education in the, in his words, larger sense and education in the narrower sense. Mill describes education in the general sense as a potentially inexhaustible topic that pertains to the development of human character and to the perfection of our nature. Education in the narrower sense has a particular social and temporal meaning as the culture which each generation purposely gives to those who be its successors. Mill suggests that it's this narrower conception of education that is the purpose of the university. An important theme throughout the rector's address is the idea of leadership. Mill's support for public policies directed towards better educating the working classes in Britain is well known. Mill defined liberal education in terms of class. It's education of all those who are not obliged by their circumstances I'm not hearing. to discontinue their scholastic studies at a very early age. The privileged classes have access to instruction that combines general cultural education with a degree of technical expertise. Mill is convinced that it's this combination of intellectual breadth and proficiency in their principal occupation that produces a body of cultivated intellects capable of fashioning an enlightened public. Thus, the true benefits of extending education across society is that it generates a broader public capable of recognizing those with superior knowledge and accepting their leadership. Given that government and civil society are, as Mill put it, the most complicated subjects accessible to the human mind, Mill cautions the St. Andrews students against becoming the blind follower of a party. Mill also highlights the complex relation between science and politics, recognizing that the greater part of scientific knowledge and discovery will likely remain the preserve of educated elites, but he insists it's in the public's interest to promote a basic scientific education diffused among the public. Because otherwise, in his words, they never know what is certain and what is not, or who are entitled to speak with authority and who is not. So liberal statecraft requires inculcating a civic responsibility among the educated classes to defend against the danger that the general public will, in, um, in Mill's words, become the ready dupes of charlatans and imposters, so to protect the public from scientific authorities. Political liberty is inseparable from the general spirit of open inquiry that pervades not only the university, but the whole society. Great discoveries will likely always be the reserve of the few, but Mill seems confident that the culture of intellectual freedom exemplified in the university will encourage a broader societal norm cherishing critical reason and evidence-based arguments. The classically trained civic leader thus provides a salutary counterweight to the authority of the natural scientist on the one hand, who would, Mill says, reduce us to slavery. How did Mill foresee the practical application of these principles of the ideal university education? This required carefully reviewing every essential department of general culture. One of the first subjects he addresses is physiology. Mill claims that some degree of familiarity with the basic elements of physiology should be a part of any public official's education. For in Mill's view, there is hardly one among us who may not in some position of authority be required to form an opinion and take part in public action on sanitary subjects. In particular, Mill emphasizes the importance of public authorities having an advanced comprehension of, wait for it, the true conditions of health and disease. Get, Another subject of university education to which Mill ascribed great public significance was the study of international law. This on the face of it is a striking contrast to physiology. If physiology is the nearest science to the public, international relations would seem to be the furthest removed from the daily lives of ordinary people. But Mill conceives of international law as a logical corollary of jurisprudence per se, which he declares is not only the chief part of the business of government, but the vital concern of every citizen. Mill contends a university curriculum that teaches the outlines of the civic and political institutions of one's country has a direct bearing 
on one's understanding of the duties of citizenship. Not to mention the added bonus of providing liberal elites with some immunity against the totalizing tendencies of what Mill identifies as, quote, any complete philosophy, either of history or politics, presumably, I think, in the Hegelian or the Marxist mold. The public itself will, Mill predicts, gradually become more truly sovereign over the international conduct of nations. Thus, the liberal university will be charged with the task of converting the traditional sport of kings into a general form of political discourse and public moral sentiment. Mill's preoccupation in the rector's address with the increased recognition among political and academic elites of the public capacity for moral reasoning also finds expression in his discussion of aesthetics. Predictably, Mill eschewed Newman's argument about the direct unity between aesthetics and theology. And indeed, he advised replacing theology with comparative religious studies. But he did point towards a view of, the, of aesthetic culture consistent with the cultivation of a certain kind of moral sympathy. While Mill offers little detail about the contribution of fine arts to university education and public life more generally, he does appear to valorize the power of poetry and song, to forge effective bonds of social sympathy and maybe even civic solidarity. Beauty supports morality in as much as it provides a hedonic motiv motivation for doing one's duty. As he says, if we wish men to practice virtue, it is worthwhile trying to make them love virtue. The study of poetry in particular provides liberal elites with a language with which to speak to the moral experience of ordinary people. But perhaps the primary importance of poetry and aesthetics more generally is as an antidote to rampant materialism. Instead of a complete surrender to the constant demands of climbing a step or two on the social ladder, as he says, poetry helps the individual in liberal society acquire a sense of what he calls nobler, objects. The focus of these nobler objects is for Mill the cultivation of a civic ideal of solidarity which reinforces the mental habits produced by the unselfish side of human nature. It allows individuals to what Mill calls identify one's joy and grief with the good or ill of the society of which we are a part. Hard to believe from the author of On Liberty. In political and socioeconomic terms, this feeling of common identity in a liberal society committed to individual freedom seems to require a complex double movement involving both the moral and intellectual elevation of the middle and working classes on one hand, and then the almost providential civic engagement of educated elites on the other. It's perhaps not surprising that given the format and the limited nature of the rector's address as a literary convention, that Mill did not elaborate on the suite of liberal causes we might expect the students and faculty in Mill's ideal university to support. It is, however, I suggest, arguably not a massive imaginative leap to consider how Mill envisioned political elites and active citizens educated in the way proposed in the rector's address, how they would think and feel about issues such as the emancipation of women, the improvement of education for the working classes, the promotion of policies of birth control, support for the union in the American Civil War, and the national commitment to a more enlightened imperial policy for Victorian Britain. That Mill left these weighty matters to other occasions and venues is probably no cause for confusion or dismay. As was fitting for its hallowed location, the rector's address wove together like an intricate tartan the diverse and harlequin threads of intellectual, cultural, and moral conditions that comprise Mill's forecast for the complex future of liberal society. Thank you. I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments. Michael? Yeah, simple question, uh, I think. When Locke in, in the essay on human understanding is talking about knowledge, he, he's talking about the, the differences between certainty, probability, and in, you know, impossibility, let's say. And you know, when we think about <clears throat> one of the objections to science today, it, it, things like evolution, 
uh, people will say, well, it's not certain, it's just a theory. And that seems to me to be, you know, part of the problem because, you know, uh, we we can't know things with certainty, but we what we're really interested in, and what's so important in education is giving people an idea of what's probable and what's not probable. So people are likely to uh, to accept conspiracy theories that are just so highly improbable. <coughs> and th- and it seems to me. So I'm wondering when you when you when you said Mill was talking about science, he was talking about how we can know what's certain and what's not. I'm wondering if in his address he really is at all concerned with the question of probability. I think so. I think so. I mean, it would make sense that he would be. I mean, his epistemology is not as um, is not as idealistic as, as as some versions of it might be. And and the the thing that concerns him about science is not the reasonable probabilities and our openness to having provisional answers to things. The thing that worries him, and this is where I think he speaks to uh, Spencer's concern, uh, Spencer's position, is this deductive epistemology, that, that science is deductive. We have these basic premises and everything flows out of that. And the model is natural science. And for Mill, the concern then is, well, there's just a, a problem of knowledge. I think it's making claims that he doesn't think that science can make. Science should have uh, a kind of respect for logic. He, at one point, he says, even Bacon, the great empiricist, understood the rules of logic. Of all the kind of um, uh, of all the uh, the disciplines that we would consider in the realm of science, the one that Spencer had the least respect for was logic. He thought we didn't really have to have it wasn't really a concern. It's something kind of antiquated about that. And Mill says, no, no, you have to have logic to tell you not so much what you're doing right, but where you're going wrong. And I think that speaks to this question of probability and a much more kind of um, uh, almost commonsensical approach to these questions. Ultimately, the problem, too, I think, is if you give, from Mill's point of view, if you give way to Spencer's argument that science is the kind of master discipline that can sort of uh, establish the rules for all other knowledges, politically, socially, it's, it's a danger to freedom. It's a surrender to a kind of elite that is, Mill says, is always going to be very few people who are capable of making these discoveries. And, you know, I think in that sense, he was, I think he was, he was quite clairvoyant. He saw something in the, the, the public today has to grapple with really complicated scientific questions. And uh, we, we see this even with the pandemic. And, you know, Mill would worry that we're not equipped to be able to either understand or assess what's being, we're being told, but also to criticize and to push back against, you know, scientific elites telling us that, you know, they have the, the only answer to these things. Thank you. So you think he would agree with, with Oakeshott then about the danger of scientism or rationalism? I don't know. Yeah, I haven't thought enough about Oakeshott, but I, I think it sounds like he would be, uh, although he's very, he's, he's no Luddite. I mean, Mill is very open and supportive of science. But as long as science has this kind of internal mechanism of recognizing its own provisionality, and not overreach and sort of imperial, and certainly in the university, if you follow Spencer's argument, the liberal arts as we know it is basically going to be exiled to sort of just private uh, leisure time. It's not something we're going to do institutionally. And Mill really pushes back on that. Mm-hmm. Hey, Leek, if I may, um, we've kind of got a queue started, um, and I'd, I'd like to just follow that if we might. So if you would like to ask a question, just push on the chat uh, function and, and enter your name and the fact that you have a question. The per- first person on the chat queue uh, as it stands uh, is Professor Afumaris. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, uh, by the way, Micah just stole one of my questions, but fortunately I have a second one. Uh, right, so right. my second question is about your, pretty much about your main argument because you, uh, in the uh, introduction and the conclusion part, which I, I found uh, probably the most interesting from a contemporary perspective, you you counterpoise the animated prim- primary, the concern about the homogenizing effect of public opinion and the uh, focus on mobilizing public opinion on behalf of liberal causes, which you argue are not uh, obviously mutually exclusive. But my question is, <clears throat> 
Let me play the devil advocate here, since Mill was in favor of devil advocate position. Uh, if all or most of public opinion supports the liberal education, the liberal causes, liberal di diversity and whatnot, isn't this another form of homogenizing public opinion in support of diversity by all means? And I think that has kind of like very contemporary repercussions. Or let me rephrase it, because uh, a little bit like in the very beginning, I think you talk about the cultivating nonconformity. But if everyone is a nonconformist, isn't this another form of conformity? And I think we can see it at work. So the, the, the petit bourgeois will be the, the hipster nowadays. <laughs> let me put it this way. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, I think the um, theoretically, there's a point at which complete nonconformity and our agreement in the value of nonconformity will spur great variety and progress. I think that's the, the ideal, at least. Um, though Mill himself was realistic enough to know that you can have liberal dogmas too. And I think his hope was that society would be able to progress and to, uh, to approach these things in a fresh way. Um, but interestingly, when he the, univer the university isn't carrying all the burden here. I mean, there's all kinds of things that will be happening outside of the university and all kinds of innovations that should be happening culturally and experiments of living that are not part of education in that more narrow sense. But interestingly, in that more narrow sense, he actually does concur with Newman in the sense that there has to be an agreement on a kind of body of books and ideas that we consider important that are the cultural transmission. And then, then we can have this kind of uh, critical reason and openness to things. So that the dogma, the liberal dogma is in Mill's view, somewhat, it, it's, it's not as bad when you do have a core body of knowledge that we can agree on and then kind of innovate from that or leap from that. The, the denial of any kind of cultural transmission of ideas would be the problem for Mill, because at that point, then, it doesn't seem to be that, that freedom even has any kind of anchor. It becomes something that's simply um, uh, idiosyncratic and simply um, uh, even, even socially destructive. I mean, one of the points that Mill makes repeatedly is that education is about overcoming selfishness, that selfish side of human nature and aspiring to noble objects. So it's not a complete sort of anything goes kind of uh, model at all. The university, if anything, is supposed to provide some kind of standards of things that are noble, but what is noble or beautiful always seems to be something that stands against materialism and something that stands against um, selfishness. So yeah, nonconformity, but don't be selfish <laughs> and have some kind of appreciation for what is beautiful. It's, it's almost as though, um, you know, it's uh, he's not as convinced of that argument as he sometimes seems to be. Okay, thank you so much. But let, let me press you a little bit further. Sure. sure. So today's uh, uh, in I don't know about Baylor, but here and I think in many other universities we have these uh, diversities programs and diversities departments and whatnot. And I was wondering how would Mill would react <coughs> to this. Uh, maybe I'm using bad words here, but like the imposition of diversity by any means. Well, I, I think that Mills, I, I take Mill's defense of academic freedom seriously. I mean, in that sense, I think Mill would say diversity as openness to debate and discourse, but as, a, in your, to use your word, imposition, I, I see Mill as a champion of academic freedom. And that's one of his concerns. It would be his difference from Newman. He doesn't think that, that the religious schools are able to maintain academic freedom. But if the imposition is coming from the other direction as well, I think Mill would equally say, um, I, I think he wanted a robust, critical environment in the university. And to the extent that diversity wouldn't do that, to the extent that it's an imposition, as you would describe it, telling people what to teach, telling people how they can, what kind of topics they can cover. I think Mill would be uh, opposed to that completely. 
I think. I might be wrong on that, but I, I, that's how I would see him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the uh, chat list is uh, Nasser Benegar. Thank you, Elite. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed your paper. It made me want to re revisit the, the St. Andrews lecture. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that your paper implicitly raises, I think it's a question that we could raise ba basically around many, many other modern philosophers as well. That is to what extent Mill was uh, committed to a political agenda and to what extent he was a genuine philosopher. And, and it seems that your conclusion uh, uh, suggests the former. Uh, and and what, I, what I, I would like to, to hear more about it is that the argument that you present um, wasn't, you know, I, I didn't see the evidence for it. You, you mentioned that there, it would not take a massive leap of imagination uh, that, uh, that he would expect that the university would support these particular political agendas. But the key thing is that it takes an imagination. And, and, and in, in the address, he, uh, he, he mentioned that education should not produce people who are blind followers of a, of a party. Uh, so, it, so, so it seems to me it's, it's one thing to say that the university serves a political education or a social education. And it's another thing to say that the university serves a, a political party. So, th so the expressions that you use, like, like liberal elites, those are not expressions I, uh, I haven't reread re the essay, but I, I assume these are, these are not the expressions that Mill uses. No, uh, no, yeah. No. Yeah, so, 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 so it seems that, uh, um, um, at, at least from the paper, I didn't see the argument that suggested that he was uh, uh, promoting a particular liberal agenda as opposed to a, um, the importance of, of uh, educating uh, citizenry in, in a liberal way. So, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think I think I'm just sort of connecting things that are not obvious connections. And I mean, part of it is that the address is not what I might have expected it to be. It, 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 a purely theoretical account or a purely cultural argument. The thing that struck me in the address is how much more political it it actually is than most of the commentators. Most commentators see very little politics in it. And I, I extract more than they do, but I, it, it's in there. He does talk about the, the, the civic responsibilities of these people who are going to come out of the English universities and what, and they're going to be, you know, they're going to govern the country. And when you look at it from that perspective, then I started to see there's more politics, even in his discussion of things like uh, ancient dialectics or his approach towards uh, science and things like physiology. He says, we are going to be, many of us are going to be in positions of public authority and we're going to have to make decisions about things like public sanitation and health and disease. And are we going to simply just be defer to scientific elites or are we going to have some kind of role to play in making these decisions and meshing them in? with social and political and legal things. And I think the idea was that the British universities haven't done a good job at that, but they haven't really paid a price because science has been relatively rudimentary, but now science is becoming much more, it's much bolder, much stronger, it's much better organized, it's much more persuasive. It still doesn't quite know how to speak to the public yet, but there's a feeling that the sort of political and social uh, uh, dimension of public life is going to be uh, diminished badly compared to science. So they need to sort of address that and speak up to it. So in that sense, it's politics, broadly speaking. I don't think he sees that as the politics of parties and causes. Where I do see the connection to causes, though, is Mills, Mill himself as a role model. If, if he is a uh, if he is a, a model of a philosopher, sort of engagé, then he was outspoken in his support for these liberal causes. And I think he felt that the universities, and there were, there were liberals in the universities at the time, but they tended to be very apolitical and they were very slow to, uh, well, they didn't support emancipation of women, but even things like supporting the union side in the American Civil War, they were very slow to do that and to, towards the secular education, I think Mill's concern was that they have to become more political, if not necessarily, you're right to point, not necessarily more partisan, but they have to be more political and they have to be able to speak to the public in ways that uh, they haven't had to do before. 
Um, so yeah, no, uh, the point's taken. I, I don't, I don't want to reduce Mill in any way just being a party hack because he wasn't. And in his defense, his positions, many of them were outside the realm of normal political discourse anyways. He didn't really have a party. He was, I mean, he was trying, one of Mill's dreams was to create a, a, a true liberal party in Britain that would modernize the constitution. And he came to the conclusion that was never going to happen in his lifetime. So if anything, to try to educate the governing class in a way that at least makes them more open to these possibilities, more sympathetic, and more as public administrators than as party people. That might be even more important to, to affect the civil service. And that, of course, was what Mill himself had been a civil servant for a very long time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just reiterate the invitation to people who have questions to um, use the chat function. Uh, and thereby get uh, in the queue. Next in the queue uh, presently is Susan Chell. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Well, uh, I, want, I just want to thank you, Lee, for this uh, really, I thought, illuminating paper. I, I, I had never read this <clears throat> rectoral address, which of course makes you think of another famous rectoral address. Um, <laughs> and um, what, what strikes me is, uh, it, is it, uh, Firstly, yes. I mean, when you're a rector of, of a new university, um, it's, it, you are making a political statement willy-nilly. Uh, universities are political institutions in our day, uh, if, if they haven't always been. And, and what strikes me is that this is the, the, the clearest, I, you know, really, it kind of was really a, a revelation to me, a, a articulation of a vision of the liberal, the modern liberal university uh, at its birth, you know, at the time around the time of his birth, that we've all sort of been coasting with, <laughs> in one way or another, and you know, now we're sort of perhaps at the moment of its senescence. I hate to be so pessimistic, but um, what strikes me about this document is um, <clears throat> partly how impressive it is in in really kind of laying out a blueprint that we're still in a way working under. And, but also that, that a kind of naivete that I think today's issues of, you know, concerning academic freedom are, are sort of a, a kind of, you know, a symptom of, uh, but, but the seeds in a way of the a kind of weakness. And I, I'll just point to two things. I mean, firstly, it occurs to me because I've been doing a, a lot of work on the um, sort of the early 19th century German, you know, it, efforts to invent a new kind of university and the degree to which Mill, who obviously was, was influenced partly by, you know, he, he says his own Humboldt and so on, that he's, he's partly channeling that in a, in, a, in, a, in a much more liberal politically and otherwise, you know, setting than the Germans had, you know, could, could, could enjoy. And in particular, the issue of aesthetics as a sort of mediating um, educational subject, uh, all of that sounds in a way very familiar. At the same time, the naivete, I guess, would be on two fronts. One would be this conflation that you point to between die, you know, if, if X is good and Y is good, then you know, they're, they're both good together. <laughs> I mean, dialectics in the ancient sense, as I understand it, I mean, firstly, it's very complicated, <laughs> but, but it, it sort of, to take it seriously, points toward, toward the conclusion that public and po popular enlightenment is not a possibility. Um, and uh, modern critique, beginning with Kant, uh, is uh, it, uh, you know for reasons that Kant lays out you know at great great length, is compatible and indeed leads to popular enlightenment, <clears throat> but in ways that you know really have to be struggled to establish. Um, and whereas Mill just seems to take it for granted that what the you know what Plato was doing is free market of ideas in some fashion. What Kant is talking about, free market, in other words, the dialectic critique, free market of ideas, it's all good. <laughs> and as long as you have a few ground rules, it's going to end well. <laughs> and it strikes me that that is just terribly naive. And just as his notion of aesthetic seems saccharine, even more than Kant, I mean, there's no sublime. I mean, what about the destructive you know, mo modern art? You know, I mean, it's all beauty and, you know, it's sort of Victorian, you know, uh, nicey nice. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's pre-impressionist, you know, kind of aesthetics. And 
Um, on the, and, and, but on the other hand, this, this, this rather naive idea that if you just have a few ground rules and people take a few basic courses in science or whatever, the free market of ideas is going to sort of turn out well. I mean, we're living in the era of Facebook where we've learned, you know, maybe to have a few qualms about that. So it's a little puzzling that he was so he was so suspicious of the free market in economic terms, you know, Spencer. Um, and I think you just beautifully show how he kind of goes down the middle between, or you can see him between Spencer and, and, and Newman. But one is also just struck by this incredible, I can say is naivete. Uh, and I just wonder if it isn't just, you know, the kind of fatal flaw that's sort of in a way built into, the, into his vision. And I wonder therefore what you would say about the true relevance of Mill for us. I mean, should we all be scrambling back to Mill or do we see in Mill the sort of incipient problems that weren't faced in the initial formulation of a liberal university that have now come a cropper? Wow, th thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, Mill's naivete, yeah. There's a kind of, uh, yeah, there's a kind of naivete, but I think it's a studied naivete in a way because, why is he so optimistic that if you just let everybody speak their mind, you know, progress and so on, rather than Hitler? <laughs> you know, yeah. Why? Where does, he, where does that come from? I yeah, mean, I, 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 there's a certain optimism in progress. I mean, there certainly is that. And the university, as he's understood, at least in England, has never been an art, it's never been a vehicle of progress. So there's a kind of, there's a yeah. certain optimism in the air because they're starting to modernize their universities and they're starting to look to the Germans and see, okay, here's an idea of a public, uh, a real public service the university could do. And when you blend that with a kind of native optimism that's just part of being British during the, you know, the Victorian period, it seems to be a natural fit. But, it, but I guess let me just press you. Yeah. But okay, it's understandable, it's attractive, we're glad for him. Mm -hmm. But for us, if it wasn't grounded and now we've come a cropper, is the lesson therefore, maybe there was something wrong with the foundation. I mean, I'm trying to push mm -hmm. you not to sort of describe mm -hmm. what he was thinking in his milieu, mm -hmm. but what does it mean for us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your I view. Guess, yeah, I guess, I, maybe I'm not as pessimistic as you. I mean, I still think there's hope <laughs> for the university today. But to the extent that we still have some kind of allegiance to the idea of the dialectic and we resist, I mean, I, I love Mill's idea of resisting these total philosophies uh, that are out there. And there's this sense with Mill, I, I guess I'll push back a little bit. I, I'm not sure he's so optimistic as he's pointing to dangers. The university is going to exist either way, but the university can become a vehicle for you know, liberal society, which is vibrant and tolerant and humane, or it can become a vehicle for something that he uses the phrase total, total philosophies of politics and history. And I, I take that to be Marxism and, and Hegelianism, I think. And there's a sense that these philosophies are going to naturally have a kind of, uh, uh, people in the university are going to be drawn to them. And the critical dialectic is a way to sort of puncture that a little bit. But what if the dialectic actually goes there? I mean, what mm -hmm. if Nietzsche is right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, yeah. I, he didn't get, he didn't think that would happen. But the point is, maybe he was wrong. And to be simply letting, well, all right, I don't want to monopolize. Yeah, no, 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 I, you know, I think you're right. I mean, but but he doesn't really talk, he's not really talking about dialectic in Plato's sense. He's no, not no. really talking about critique in Kant's sense. Yeah. He's talking about this sort of mushy, if we just all sort of, you know, discuss, it'll work. You know, It seems to me mushy. <laughs> and that sure. we're, kind of, there's a fatal mushiness there, mm. which we're suffering from now because it, perhaps it wasn't, sufficiently um, examined at the outset. And maybe- Could be. But in Mill's defense, may maybe the problem is the mushiness is the fact that it wasn't political enough. I mean, I think he's trying to say that the universities have to be political. In a liberal society, they have to be yeah, liberal. They do, yeah. yeah I mean, and and they, they, didn't, they weren't political enough. And they became, I mean, Mill might say that we became too captive to disciplinary hegemony and certain things that became the- I'm not the, doubting that he has a lot to teach us. And that I think you bring that out beautifully. And that you and and that really how the humanities can make a case for itself. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if the deep down mm -hmm. there aren't some real difficulties in his position 
that also have to be faced up to if we're going to survive as a viable, you know. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. And I think- I think Society and, you know, university, you know, institutionally. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, absolutely. And I mean, even today, I mean, think of Newman's influence on the Ex Corte Ecclesia, the, the, the sort of defining document of the modern Catholic university. It's still an alternative to Mill's argument, although he's, he's given, given a lot of ground to Mill. But there's an argument of, you know, academic freedom is guaranteed as long as it's consistent with truth and the common good. That's the official position in the ex corte. And then on the other side, we have an argument straight out of Spencer for the, the STEM and the need to totally revolutionize commercialized education. So I, I agree with you. I think we have to rethink this. Although the one thing is the last thing I'll say is I think that Mill believes the dialectic is going to push down into um, uh, a greater sense of subjectivity. Now, I, 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 I take your point about Nietzsche, we might wind up there, but he sees that as a kind of unexplored realm that the university is going to be less about the sort of, sort of traditional um, uh, disciplines and we're gonna discover new grounds of um, the kind of edgy psychology of modern personality. Whether that's what the university should be doing, I think you're right, maybe that's a good question. Well, let me just, so one final point. Yeah, sure. So I think Kant, who in, all, in a way also was a kind of initiator of the liberal university, I think he was more careful or he thought that more guardrails had to be put up. For example, for him, and maybe it was partly because of what was possible then, academic freedom within the philosophy faculty, which for him was really arts and sciences. But you don't naively think you can just have academic freedom everywhere. It doesn't work politically, and it leads to things that make any academic freedom impossible. Or you have uh, public, you know, <coughs> public reason, but within the Republic of Letters, not you know, MSNBC, not everywhere. I mean, he kind of understood that there were dangers too, and I think we've sort of gone crazy to think that the more freedom, freedom, you know, freedom of expression, the better, and there are no limits. And I think some of the earlier guys had a somewhat more prudent appreciation for how, you know, how you can't just let it rip. <laughs> there have to be guardrails. And maybe Mill kind of didn't have, maybe his guardrails, although they're obviously there, were not sufficient. Yeah, I think he thought he thought you had to bend the wood the other way. He thought the natural tendency was towards this kind of homogeneity. So you have to sort of bend it to get even a little bit of freedom on it. But thank you, that's, a lot. that's great. Thank you. Sorry. No trouble. <laughs> uh, next on the, um, in the queue is Jeff Church. Yeah, Lee, thanks. Uh, this was great. I also don't know this essay all that well, but uh, you know, so I wanted to ask you questions how, how it connects up with, uh, you know, some of Mill's other works, uh, its concept. I mean, particularly, you know, kind of what I was struck by was some of the omissions in the sense that, um, you know, I mean, what, what, one of the, one of the things I one might have expected after reading, say, like you know, Mill's chapter on individuality and on liberty, that you might think that one of the purposes of the university would be to cultivate individuality or you know, self-realization or something like that, as in the contemporary <laughs> parlance. But but that seems to be not not exactly you know the a primary function, right? That there there's there's a different you know you have to think classical education and, 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 and dialectics and poetry isn't about finding yourself. It's about finding other people. So and in any case, I didn't know if you had a, any, any thoughts about that sort of discrepancy. I think that the bigger one though, that I wanted to ask you about was the, you know, the uh, considerations on representative government mill and how this kind of connects up with him, especially I'm thinking on, you know, mill has this chapter on a couple chapters on um, national character and the way in which you know, one might have expected that Mill might say something about how the university relates to the nationalism versus cosmopolitanism question, you know, that is like, you know, so is the purpose of a university to facilitate national characters to, to sort of impress on students a certain kind of national character when they, when, when they leave such that they can be leaders to transmit national character from one generation to another? Um, or is this, you know, a cosmopolitan project of, um, you know, sort of liberating uh, the elite such that they can challenge the, the cosmopolitan scientific elite 
Um, I mean, both of these ways and connecting up with Mill, I mean, I think, you know, it's exciting your project because it, it's, you know, speaks to questions about like university today and whether the university's role is about in what way is the university's role about self-realization and what ways does the university, especially public universities connect with questions of national character versus cosmopolitanism. So if you had any, any, any thoughts on that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, first the individuality. Yeah, it's, it's striking. I would have thought that too. I mean, that's that's one of the things that struck me. And that's how some people have read the Rector's Address as just a, a kind of version of a generic argument for freedom. And I don't see that. I think that it, it, it's it's much more uh, subtle than that. And, and the, the thing that's striking is the argument for a kind of civic responsibility among sort of the, you know, the, the future ruling class in Britain as, as if they, they hadn't been sufficiently uh, enlightened in, in government for the nation. And, and especially given the fact, we know from his other works, that the, uh, the working classes are, are, are rising in importance. They're becoming more, they're better educated. They're having more to say about how the nation is run. So it seems to be that the, the, the ruling class have to up their game if they're going to continue to rule in a modern liberal state. So that's the first thing. Yeah, I mean, you take individuality seems to be a message that's appropriate for one moment in time for one audience. And then when he gets um, sort of one-on-one -on -one directly speaking to the university, it's not, it's not the argument of on liberty, but rather something more, something different, more, more institutional. Whether it's part of the national cosmopolitan debate, that's a that's an interesting question too. Because my my sense, I see very little cosmopolitanism in the rector's address. If anything, it seems to be grounding more in terms of national character, grounding the the liberal elites in the nation and its laws and understanding its uh, uh, understanding sort of the culture. But again, for Mill, I don't think he thinks the university. There's things the university can't do. We can't ask too much for it. So it's not going to be responsible for forming national character. If anything, it can be more of a reflection of it. The one thing though that I might that might speak to a cosmopolitanism, and I don't think it, I'm not sure if it's a it wouldn't be maybe as, as rigorous as a Kantian cosmopolitanism, but there's something about the aesthetic. There's something about um, you know, and Susan says it's got it's something mushy about it, but it might be the, one of the things that Mill thinks can sort of expand the moral and mental horizons of the people who run, who run the country at, at, or should be running the country. Um, you know, this emphasis on the beautiful. And uh, I take that to be a kind of a counter argument to a, a, the kind of realism he thinks is sort of pervading British politics at the time. And, you know, Britain is a great power and, it, and it's acting as powers do. And it's not reflecting on its own actions in a way that has any kind of great moral sympathy and sense of its effects in the rest of the world. And that's something that Mill was concerned about. And he was a tough guy and he was happy. He was willing to have empires. He was willing to for Britain to throw its weight around. But I think he felt that the... The temptation of power combined with the rampant materialism had the potential to create a new kind of Philistinism in, in England. And, and this desire, the openness to beauty, he, he cites Goethe, that's his authority on that. Maybe that might be a way to have a kind of cosmopolitanism that points beyond just national character, but I'd have to think about that. Thank you. Um. Well, next in the queue is Michael Gillespie, but I take it from his note that he's um, willing to let those who have not yet had a chance to ask a question go first, and we can come back to Michael if there's time. So let me uh, call on Michael Zucker. So my microphone, I hope is working now. Um, I have a question that's a little bit more strictly textual about your, about your paper, Lee. And I, this is a, a passage on page 27, um, and it's in the sort of middle paragraph there. Uh, you, here's what you say. Liberal statecraft requires inculcating a degree of civil responsibility, civic responsibility among the educated classes to defend against the danger that the general public will either have no faith at all in the testimony of science or are the ready dupes of charlatans and imposters. And then your comment on that, the classically trained political leader and civil administrator provides then 
is salutary counterweight to the authority of the natural scientist. Now, your comment on that struck me as very strange because that didn't seem to me at all what he was actually saying in the passage that you quoted. Um, in fact, taking the general context of the discussion, it seems to me his point is more, we're going to, we're going to protect against the uh, charlatans and imposters that we're going to be able to distinguish between real scientists who really know something and charlatans and imposters. So it's not a guard against the scientists, it's a more a arming of the scientists against the charlatans. Or another way to put this question is, how do you think Mill stands on Anthony Fauci? <laughs> <laughs> so everything, yeah. comes, back. everything comes back to Fauci. Yeah, so, no, no, and also when he talks about, you quote him on physiology and uh, uh, um, you know, all the, all the important things about public health and so on, he seems to be wanting to give those people authority. They should have the authority. They should be listened to. Not not so much to guard against them, but we should listen to them. That's the way. I, that's why I, I was at least reading your set. I haven't read this piece by Mill myself. I haven't even heard of it before. So I'm grateful to you for calling it to my attention. But um, how do you? What do you say to that? Yeah. Well, I think just textually, a little further down on page twenty-seven, just after the part you read. I, 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 I sort of flesh out, I think, would say he's concerned that they would reduce us to slavery. The people he thinks would reduce us to slavery are people with real claims. I don't think it's it's the charlatans that do. That's part of it. He wants. Are you sure? I, I mean, that, that, part, that is a, I, I saw that, of course, but I, I didn't know how to take that because the quotation was somewhat seemed to me. I, I mean, I, I'd like to see the whole passage where sure. he says what, just what he says. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, that's the way I interpret it. And I think that it goes to the Fauci question. I think as science, science is science. Fine. And the, the public have to be uh, capable of responding critically to scientific debates. Not all scientists speak with one voice, but also the politicians have to have a certain kind of confidence that they can themselves digest scientific advice and make decisions that are not simply based on the science. Uh, that's the way I interpret it. But mm -hmm. the problem- That's is, the Texas, that's the Texas reading. Yeah, I don't know if it's Texas reading, but it seems to me, it, what he's saying is in England, if all you're doing is, is writing bad translations of Homer and that's your education, you're gonna get steamrolled by these natural scientists who are getting better and getting sharper. So we're going to have to be able to at least converse with them in a way, but to think of science in a public way. And that, I mean, Spencer's doing that from the opposite direction. He's taking Darwin and applying it to society. And that's what he's known as the social Darwinist. And science yeah. is encroaching on politics. And I think if anything, Mill thinks that the so traditional political, moral and ethical realm has to defend itself against science. Well, maybe maybe Mill is taking Spencer to be a, a charlatan and an imposter. Maybe that's why Spencer took so took it so hard that uh, this particular critique. In which case, it wouldn't be protecting against a scientist. Spencer wasn't a scientist. He was a he was somebody who was a popularizer of yeah. science and an applier in ways that, as I was told by somebody, Darwin himself didn't approve of. Yeah, no, that's true. But there's are there's people like Huxley who were he was Darwin's bulldog, and I think they're a little yeah. bit more better scientists. I don't think that was yeah. the test for him. It wasn't whether they're good scientists or not. It's that they should stay in science. That that one of the I try to make a suggestion towards the end of the paper, and it's you know it's it's pretty un <laughs> it's ungrounded, but nonetheless that. The, the the university curriculum has to be diverse to prevent it being captured by one particular master discipline. And I think one of them is science. He does think that the sciences are going to take over the institution. And the other one, obviously, is religion. That's what traditionally is. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, not make, I'm not trying to make a claim that he wants to join the science, you know, make the scientists the, the rulers of society, but rather that the emphasis is somewhat different from the way at least you presented it in this context. That's all. That's sure. That no, is, absolutely. It meant to it is meant to give the scientists some support and maybe to draw limits to when they're being misapplied. But mm -hmm. sure. I mean it's it's degrees. If if, yeah. if the public is completely unenlightened and they still believe in you know wood fairies and sprites and stuff, yeah, I think Mill is pro-science. But I don't think he thinks that's where the British public is, even in the 19th century. I think that, if anything, 
particularly among educated people, it's a kind of aw shucks, you know, just wonder at what's what's happening around them. Early in the piece, he says, you know, the, the productive powers of the world have proven science. We don't need to make the case for it. We know what it can do. So if anything, I think he's, he's he would recognize you're right. People shouldn't be superstitious and they shouldn't, uh, they should have some kind of understanding of natural science. But the thing that struck me as interesting is he's projecting even, I think almost contemporaneously, he's pushing in a direction almost like Heidegger towards looking at this technology and looking at its moral and spiritual effects too. But yeah, no, I, I agree with what you said. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think we come back around then to Michael Gillespie. Uh, yeah, Lee, I, I have to say I'm a little bit shocked at your anti-Spritism, you know, especially in Texas. But we'll leave, <laughs> we'll leave that aside. Uh, my question really is, is uh, goes to the context in which he's delivering this address, because Britain is the world's largest empire at this point. And the people that are being, you know, it, it's just in a few years, the, you know, the founder of the Olympic Games is going to say the British Empire is built on the playing fields of rugby and Eton. Right. And and, the, you know, you, you know, the university education was in part uh, an education to help facilitate the, the growth of the empire. Right. Uh, a few years after this, after the Franco-Prussian War, <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of European education is transformed because, you know, and they turn back to teaching the classics and in particular because they think they need to produce martial elites. Uh, you know, this is especially true in France, right? And, and, but even in England, you know, as Owen would later say, you know, our, 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 tu our tutors kept telling us, you know, pulchrum et decorum est pro patria mori, right? So, you know, in a way, the, the, uh, <laughs> it, it seems in a certain sense, like, I wonder whether, lib whether Mill's education really aims, has an imperial vision to it, or if it's just confined to England, and, and it, even if it is just confined to England, isn't it sort of almost completely superseded by what happens afterwards? And, and isn't the decline of uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, um, the faith in the university and the faith in knowledge, doesn't that really have much more to do with what happens in the First World War and, and the destruction of all of these people who, who bought this Marshall notion? So I wonder whether Will isn't, you know, isn't either left as a kind of backwater that then we have to recur to, you know, after, you know, the disasters of the early 20th century or, or whether he really did have the kind of impact that he was hoping to have. Yeah, no, good. that's a great question. Yeah, I, I don't think Mill, I mean, this is towards the end of his life, so he never really saw beyond, you know, this. I don't, I, I don't think he's terribly hopeful. I think, he sees the university as part of a larger kind of cultural project. And um, he didn't expect the university to carry all the weight. But the one thing it seemed to be able to do, or, and, and this might speak to Susan's argument about his naivete, that it could somehow combine the romantic and the scientific in a way that could sort of mediate between these two things. And you're suggesting that really the romantic becomes the, because, the scientific isn't going to give you the imperial vision. It's not going to build the kind of empires you want. The romantic will do it. And that becomes the sort of uh, the civilizational suicide in the First World War. Well, the, yeah. si the science, I would say, and the growth of science and the triumph of science in many ways has to do with its ability to produce the weapons that killed all of those people in the First World War. Right, the the, the improvements in, in munitions and gunpowder and all of the you know TNT, all of those things. That's a, that was an enormously powerful, and that was the reason that science was so successful then, and I think so successful after the Second World War. Right, it, it was its claim it could really do things that made a huge difference for <coughs> for the regime. Whereas you know, and and in a way, you could say almost that a lot of the universities piggybacked on that by producing the kinds of soldiers that would could you know who were willing to use those weapons to to fight a war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that I think it's a good point. I mean, the, the 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 idea that the university, I'm just sort of projecting and thinking about Germany as well, that the universities themselves can be captive. 
to sort of national ambitions. It would be, again, that Mill's hope, and maybe it's naive, is that there'd be enough kind of critical discourse within the university that it wouldn't, that wouldn't happen, but it clearly did. It did well, happen. One of the things that we see in those universities is exactly a movement away from philosophy as a central discipline and a movement towards national languages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the teaching in Latin that is, you know, the it, everything becomes centered around nationalism and national languages. And it, it obviously it's intensified by by World War One, but but yeah. that was already certainly present in the late 19th century. And Mill's, Mill's clear on that. He's, you don't need to go to university to study English. You go to university to study Latin and Greek. Yeah, yeah he's very clear on that. And that's the thing about the study of the ancient literatures and ancient languages is precisely that it pulls us out of our own particular context. So let's go back to Jeff's argument earlier, or Jeff's question earlier. No, actually, in a way, he's doing both things because he is trying to pull the educated class out of their own sort of national identity towards some kind of, but it's not for the purpose of some republic of letters or anything, but rather for the, to make them more self-conscious about political, moral, and ethical questions, that the ancients are just different enough. That they allow us to pull ourselves out. But yeah, he, he's worried the, the university is going to become a, a sort of uh, a vehicle of national politics. Uh, Stefan Copert. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Okay, great. Um, so I was wondering about, um, I guess, to follow up on some of these other questions about the possible, the thought that there might be some squishiness in in uh, Mill's idea or naive idealism here, or for for what he thinks the university can accomplish. It seems like he might be hiding some kind of actual idealism or something. Um, God forbid. <laughs> uh, but I'm wondering about the what he um, has it in the in his in his piece on, on utilitarianism with the decided preference test. I think it's in chapter two or something where he suggests that we can sort of rank the different pleasures in life. Um, if happiness is the goal, we can rank pleasures based on you know we'll be able to ask people who've experienced both what they prefer. And that'll be an objective way to sort of create a, a hierarchy of pleasures. And if that, I mean, that, se that there seems to me a very naive kind of um, starting point for, for a moral hierarchy in a society. And if that's maybe underpinning um, his thoughts of what a university can do, that it'll just hum along because people who've been exposed to different things always prefer the nobler, the better, the more wonderful. Um, and that, that would sort of provide a moral compass for the, for the university. Um, I was just thinking uh, when you were talking about how he hoped the university would be able to stem the tide of materialism or something like that. Um, if, do you think that would be one way to critique this whole scheme to say that the, to point to that decided preference test um, might not be as strong as he makes it out to be? Or um, do you think that connection is tenuous? Hmm. My inclination is to think that it, it might not hold as much as you think, because if we go back to utilitarianism, the context is his actually his critique of a, 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 a kind of vulgarized form of utility, that it's simply pleasure is irrespective of uh, it's is irrespective of uh, uh, quality is just quantity so tons and tons and tons of really stupid pleasure equals one you know beautiful uh, five minutes in front of a Picasso painting or something so that I think is to me his argument is pretty strong I actually think that's a, that's, a, that's one of his better arguments but it depends on exposure to beautiful things and to me, where, where your question, I think, does, that does, I think, point to something interesting, is what exactly is the beautiful? What is the noble? He uses these terms, but he doesn't define them particularly. All I, what I extract from it is a certain kind of anti-materialism. And that in itself isn't particularly um, liberal. I mean, far from it. Newman, I think, would make the same argument. It is clearly directed against Spencer. 
which is a kind of materialist, the whole the materialist philosophy is materialist worldview. So we're going to have some conception of the noble. We're going to have some conception of the beautiful. And the university will be a place where the people he thinks are going to be the leaders are going to be exposed to these things. That I think is not a contra- I, mean, I don't I don't see it as contradictory, but it presupposes something that he's quite candid about in his response to Spencer, which is we're drawing off the cultural heritage here. We're not, you know, if anything, the tension in Mill's argument that I see is between seeing the university as a place of cultural transmission. So there are these great works and this is what we study, but also being open to new discoveries of information, uh, new discoveries of knowledge. And that's where Newman steps in and says, hold on a second. That's not a university. University Research is not for universities. Mill seems to want both. He wants to be able to say that we have this teaching mission that is um, a cultural transmission that allows people then to be individuals. Because if you've never been exposed to the great works, if you've never been exposed to the beautiful things, you won't really be able to develop yourself. Fine. But he also wants it to be a place where we're discovering new things all the time. He wants it open to psychology, political economy, things that were considered, you know, either uh, too, irrever- too irreverent or kind of vulgar for the university. That's the, to me, that's ultimately a, a really interesting question is, uh, can Mill have both? But if that's, if that's the heart of the question, then that's, that's our lives. I mean, that's all of us in this session today are living this. This is the modern university, a teaching function and some sense of retaining core books and ideas and things that human beings have talked about for a long time, things like the dialectic versus openness to new discoveries. And does the new discovery in some way undermine the commitments to the old truths? Yeah, I think the mill is if I think he reflects the kind of contradictions within our idea of the modern university in a way that Newman doesn't. Newman just says, no, we're not, that's not what we do. What we're doing, we're forming people. We're forming Catholics, we're forming people a certain way. Although it's interesting in the ex corde ecclesia, that's, this, this is the papal encyclical from 1990. It's sort of the last sort of important statement by the Catholic church on the Catholic universities. It's very Newman-esque. And John Paul cites Newman uh, a number of times, but it also makes the point that the Catholic University is committed to research. So that's one important kind of concession to, I guess, a million idea. And it raises all the same tensions because when you have academic freedom, the Excorde says, we guarantee academic freedom for all faculty and Catholic universities, as long as it's consistent with truth in the common good. But these are timeless questions, so we haven't gotten out of it, but I don't think Mill's, uh, we can, I don't, I'm not sure we can blame Mill for not being able to answer that. But yeah, good question, thank you. <clears throat> well, we are coming up on our time, but we have a few minutes left if there's another question. Um, if not, I, I guess I would like to uh, maybe build on the answer you just gave to uh, Stefan and ask you, draw you out a little bit more on Mill's, what Mill has to say about the, the noble um, in this address and its connection with um, a particular kind of education that refines uh, or enables us to acquire sensibilities uh, that, uh, that help us to, I guess, experience the noble. I mean, does it follow from what Mill has to say that the noble is for Mill something of an aesthetic experience? And as such, um, does he have, does he offer us some direction, um, some concrete direction and just how uh, the sensibilities, the, the right sensibilities might be cultivated uh, in order to have uh, an experience of the noble? I mean, the other side of this, it seems to me, is that the, uh, you, you might expect uh, Mill to, um, to, to define the, the, the noble in rather functional terms. Um, but, but he seems to harken back to uh, even a pre-Socratic tradition in, in which to, the idea of the beautiful and the noble, as you've kind of emphasized uh, multiple times, uh, are one and the same. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in what he might, what direction he might offer in, in, in terms of the kind of cultivation of aesthetic sensibility um, that would point us in the direction of what's truly noble. 
Yeah, thanks. I think this is, if anything, sort of towards the end of his life, it seems that this was a question that Mill was, was really fascinated with because, um, oh, let me step back a little bit. What the aesthetic is not in the university is not religious. He's very clear on that. So the noble is distinct from any idea of religion. The noble is also distinct from any idea of practical utility. He says the university is not about practical training. And Spencer, it basically is. It is about skills training as well, in addition to, to the higher sciences. So what is it then? Well, it's poetic. And he makes an interesting suggestion, he gives an interesting suggestion at one point that as much as he praises the study of ancient languages and ancient literature, he says, I still am modern because he thinks the modern poetry is superior. And the reason it's superior is because it, it has penetrated the depth of human psychology in a way that the ancients did not, hmm. or not to the same degree. So the ancient, we see sort of concepts basically as people. Um, okay, oh yeah, uh, concepts attached to people. For um, Mill, the noble is anti-materialists. It is the unselfish side of human nature, but it doesn't go in the direction of religious experience or in the direction of sort of practical knowledge that allows us to do stuff for other people. So what is it? Well, I mean, we know he himself, in his, uh, uh, towards the end of his life, he was working on the, um, the lectures on religion and trying to develop a kind of, um, a kind of, he calls it a religion of humanity. And the saints are Socrates, George Washington, Marcus Aurelius, and some guy whose name I can't remember, who was an important prison reformer in Victorian England. So some famous people and not so famous people. But the idea is that we'll have people that we can point to as examples of what is noble. Um, and in that sense, it's pretty Aristotelian too. I mean, you, Aristotle can't just define the noble, but it's something you can point to and say, that's it, that, that's courage or that's moderation, that person there. And in that sense, it seems like a classical idea of the noble, but with this modern discovery of the subjective interior subconscious self that leads us to potentially to other things uh, Susan would say to Nietzsche or to Freud, or I'm not sure what comes out of it. But if that's true, then Mill is a kind of interesting transition phase. He's still got enough of the old kind of knowledge and he's already moving towards a new kind of psychology. But I still think Mill would resist the idea of psychology, just simply taking over the university as well. I mean, one of the things we always have, the classic books, the classic authors to go back to and protect us from these intellectual fads and academic, um, you know, uh, the sort of whatever academic fad happens to be coming right at that moment. But yeah, you're not gonna, I, I don't see a, no, a conception of a noble that is completely self-contained, but rather one that's uh, drawing off psychology, poetry, and um, uh, the aesthetics, which again, um, I don't know how strong that is. Speaking of Susan Chell, she wants to ask one last question about this matter. Yeah. Are you there, Susan? There's this idea that there, his understanding of the aesthetic is transitional. I think it's a great, you know, a great thought. Um, because yeah, as you say, I mean, the modern, first thing, aesthetics is a sort of 18th century you know, conception. It didn't really, there's no real equivalent in ancient thought as I understand. Poetry is not quite the same as the aesthetic. And suddenly the aesthetic is asked to do a lot of work by modern thinkers, maybe coming out of Rousseau's critique, you know, in the first discourse famously, you know, maybe, maybe development of the arts and so on and sciences is bad for us morally mm -hmm. uh, and in other ways. And so uh, kind of as a response to that, the aesthetic as a way of having your cake and eating it too. Um, but it has this, it, you know, it has this double feature that I think probably Mill is perfectly aware of that the it's bifurcates into the beautiful and the sublime. So you, the beautiful is no longer the noble, 
<laughs> exactly. You think of Burke and his essay on the beautiful and the sublime, the noble has sort of gotten smudged over it with the kind of demonic and, you know, these unleashed forces of the soul, you know, freedom and so on. And the beautiful is more treacly in a way. It's more, you know, it's more of the feminine, the pretty, uh, bucolic. And so, so all kinds of really interesting things that are going to explode, but that are still somehow held together in Bill, which <coughs> is a very interesting feature that you, yeah, I think that your, your paper points to. And whether the, the lid can be held on for how long <laughs> is a real question. But I think it's great the way you sort of show how he's, Kind of an intermediary, kind of mediating figure. So thanks. Here's yeah. again, yeah. Kudos yeah. again. <laughs> and I was thinking as you were talking to. I mean, one of the the other thing I would I would think is the uh, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers too. The yeah, the way he praises that. that. Yeah. Yeah, sentiment as the so noble right. as a sentiment itself is a very kind of modern uh, prejudice, I guess. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we've, we're about out of time. I uh, want to thank Lee Ward, obviously, for uh, his presentation and his entertaining of our questions um, and invite everybody back uh, next month, March. Uh, I forget exactly what day we're doing this. Maybe Jeff's uh, there hanging in the, uh, in the I, I, for, I forget too, but it's the first, <laughs> it's the first Friday in March. Whatever. First Friday in March, okay. There will be, a, there, there should be a, a, something in your email. And, and this time I hope with a reliable uh, link to the Zoom meeting. <laughs> uh, so we'll see everybody in March.